Thank you, Priscilla. Good morning, El Paso Bible Church. Hope everyone's doing well, even though there's, I know, a, lot, a little bit of flu and colds and congestion going around. And uh, hope everyone will get through that. Uh, hopefully, also you received as you walked in a bulletin which identifies the activities of the church. Uh, the one thing to be highlighted, of course, is this evening is the, uh, uh, our Christmas dinner. So uh, this evening, 6 o'clock-ish, ish, no, 6 o'clock on time um, is when we'll ha be having our uh, uh, Christmas uh, dinner. Today's Communion Sunday, of course. We're going to have a Christmas Eve service, and we're looking for uh, folks to uh, read scriptures. Uh, on Christmas Eve, so uh, we need those volunteers. Uh, I think that's all we're going to be uh, talking about today and highlighting. But if you want to open your Bibles to uh, John 13:34, we'll read that short uh, uh, passage that of, of Jesus talking, and uh, then we'll sing together. Then we'll pray together, and then we'll sing together. All right, in the New King James Version, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Blessed be the reading of the God's word to us. All right, why don't we bow our heads together, we'll pray. We'll pray for also those folks who are online with us. If you'll bow and pray with us, we'll, we'll then get on to singing and worshiping the Lord in song. But f first, Lord, we start by coming to you in prayer together as a, as a body of believers. We come uh, thanking you, first of all. Uh, we'll be communing today, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. But we thank you for the daily provision that you give us, how you provide for us, how you care for us. Lord, we don't always know the reason for things that happen around us, of course, or things that happen to us or to family members. Or uh, we, just, we don't fully comprehend your ways all the time, but we know that your ways are higher than our ways and that your love for us goes beyond our understanding. You have made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. Lord, we pray for those folks who are not with us today for any number of reasons. Maybe they're traveling. We give, ask for you to uh, bring them back to us safely. And for those who are not feeling well or sick, we pray, Lord, for their healing and recovery. Father, I ask now that you would bless our service. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Would you now stand with us for a time of worship? Run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I saw Satan wonder I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over Oh, 
Savior was born upon this day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comforting joy, comforting joy. Oh, tidings of comforting joy. God, our heavenly Father, this blessed angel king, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. Her love, love, love. 
Well, good morning. Y'all all sound like me. I thought I was going to have to apologize, but uh, we uh, sound like we have fellowship, huh? That's how everybody is. Uh, so we need to certainly need to be praying for that situation. Honestly, uh, serious uh, number of folks suffering from uh, different respiratory things. Uh, and other folks are traveling, as Steve mentioned. Uh, so we want to make sure to remember them as well. And, uh, and just pray for our, our hearts, right? We, we get so caught up in what we might identify as a normal year, right? Have we had one of those recently? We haven't had a normal year. And in normal years, we struggle keeping the focus where it needs to be uh, on Sunday mornings, certainly in the season of Advent coming into Christmas. Uh, but we do. We need to focus that as well, extra effort, extra encouragement from the body, I think, would be a good way to say that. So let's pray together, and we'll do that, and then we'll continue on this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you that, uh, that we can be here today, uh, that we have the freedom to do that, that we have the desire to do that, um, and that... Uh, we can come together and, and experience the joy of fellowship and singing together and learning your word together, but simply being together as well. And we thank you for that. And it's a privilege and an honor that we have. Uh, that that's not just something that we have inserted in our brain like some sort of weird matrix that we, we can experience but not touch or feel or see, but that you're designed to, we're designed to live life together like that. Now, Father, we do pray for those who are, are suffering from varying levels of respiratory uh, viruses, whether they're on the, the incline or the decline, or wherever they are in the process. Father, we do pray for quick healing, that they would be able to enjoy their holiday as it's coming up as well, and just simply be able to function. Uh, Father, we pray for those who are caring for those uh, who are feeling those effects, that, uh, that they would have strength and wisdom in that as well. And, for those in our body who are ill with other things, we pray for continued guidance, for continued wisdom uh, with their caregivers and, uh, and the doctors. We pray uh, for complete healing and for them as well. We don't want to leave them out. Uh, and, and Father, we do pray that you bless our time in your word today according to your glory in us and through us. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, children, I didn't dismiss you already. Did the adventurers already go? Sometimes they go. They haven't gone yet, Steve says. So if you're in the adventurers class, we have adventurers class today. Remember, Explorers doesn't meet on Communion Sunday, so we don't have big kid church. This is big church, according to most kids, right? But big kid church, we don't have for the big kids today. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is that uh, we're a little late at this point, but there are a few of these out front. If you haven't picked one up, this was put together by the faculty of Dallas Seminary, kind of as an Advent devotional. So, because y'all are like, we're all recovering Baptist or something, right? I don't know. We don't even know what Advent is, right? Uh, a lot of you don't, but if you want to catch up, there's still time to do that, and you can take one of these. I think there's one for everybody at least, um, and so that would be 
something that you could start today if you'd like. They've been out there for a while, but I'm not sure that we announced it, so uh, consider that. You can consider me culpable uh, for that. It probably is my fault that things get like that. All right, so if you have your Bibles, let's open to 1 John uh, chapter 3. We're just covering a couple of verses today, significant, I think, verses, uh, certainly uh, well, I mean, you know, when I say significant, that's, that is, uh, I don't know, there's, there's Paul telling Timothy, please remember my coat, right? So we're, that, that's, it's part of God's Word, it's inspired, it's authoritative, but it's hard to make an application, right? So this one is direct application. In that sense, it's something that we can use, you can use, some people say, as you walk out the door, you don't have to wait that long to use these two verses out of 1 John chapter 3. You can start using them in the pew right now, and I hope that you do. Uh, but remember that 1 John has as its purpose to instruct, to give us the capacity to act in ways that foster, develop, I don't know if I want to use the word create, it's not ex nihilo, but it is forming fellowship. Fellowship between the body of Christ, which is also with the apostles, which, whose fellowship, John says, is with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It is a package that we can experience as we act in ways that remove impediments. And that's the way the first part of the instruction flows, right? That we, this should be seen as our natural state of affairs that we exist, that we live, that we act in ways that are in fellowship with each other and with God the Father and with Jesus Christ. And I mention that because that is not what most people, I think, perceive of as the status quo in their church experience. I've mentioned this at various times, and I'm not trying to be a pessimist, because you know, you guys know, everybody knows that I'm an unmitigated optimist, right? That's what you know about me. If anything else, I'm an unmitigated optimist. But occasionally, we have to still remind ourselves of things that might not be totally and absolutely positive. And as a pastor, it's, it's, it's disheartening to me to hear people say, well, that's just church. Like, that's actually one of the more mature responses you get sometimes because they're not leaving because of it, in a way, right? Well, you know, that's just church. Church is like that sometimes. I'm like... It may be like that sometimes, but we ought not to be happy about it. And we should, I mean, we, we need to be forgiving. We need to, to be long-suffering. We need to be mature. We need to understand the trajectory that we are all on together, that one day we will be in the presence of Christ together, and all of those issues will be gone because we will be like Him at that point. But we're not supposed to kind of view church is uh, on one of those Viking ships. We're all in the, all chained together, oaring together. You think they were having a good time rowing the oars all together? They were eventually going to get out of there one way or another, heck or high water. They were all together. They were all in it together. <laughs> it should be joyful, right? And that's what John says. He says, we want to have fellowship together so that we can experience the fullness of of joy that Jesus has designed for us to experience together. And so that's what we, we need. That's what we should be trying to, to follow these commands for in order to experience a fullness of joy. And so we have to deal with sins in our lives. Jesus Christ has dealt with sin, the penalty right there. You have zero judicial penalty for sin in your life if you are in Christ, if you have believed in him. But as his children, God does discipline us, right? We do still sin against each other. We do still seek forgiveness so that we can not live our whole lives under discipline. It fosters fellowship and fosters joy in our lives. And then we will, we will be like him. We need to look forward to that day when we will be with Jesus uh, and see him as he truly is and be like him as he truly is, knowing that all of us will be there together. I went to a, a small Lutheran preschool 
uh, when I was a little kid, probably, well, I don't know, smaller than Abraham. Our, jingle, our Captain Jingle Bell's up here, man. Good job, Abraham. He, he, is he in here? Yeah, oh, he's in the children's church. All right. Smaller than him and younger than him. And it was the custom back in the day, back when you could bring cupcakes and not kill everybody. Right? Because there was a day where we could bring cupcakes for our birthday and not everybody would die. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but that's how it was. And my mother, I remember, counted out the cupcakes because she wanted to make sure we had enough. So we counted through and counted through. But I had an enemy in preschool, an arch enemy. And I was talking to my mother, and she'll tell you this story. Um, just say, well, Joshua, there's, there's one cupcake per children, per child. And I said, well, my arch enemy is not a children, is he? Because I did not want to give him a cupcake because that's how I rolled in preschool. See, we kind of act that way sometimes, right? When we come to the realization that we are on the same trajectory together, we are children of God by means of the great love that the Father has bestowed upon us. We're all moving in that direction. We will all be like Him. We will be with Him forever. And some of us already are holding our nose, right? I don't want to be with that person forever. But you do want to be with people that are like Jesus forever, don't you? Right? You don't have to like me right now, but I'm not going to be like this forever. Yes? Amen? Uh, Y'all can amen that one. See, they teach us in preacher school to take that one on the chin and not say, you know, not to say y'all are not going to be like you forever, but that's true too. You won't be like this forever either. You're going to be like Jesus when we see Him. Now, there are some commands. We know a lot of the commands. We're supposed to confess our sins. There are some that you remember because they're stated more like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, you shall do this, you shall not do that, you shall do this. There are other ones, right? John says, don't be surprised when the world hates you. That's an imperative. Don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard. Don't marvel when that happens. That's part of having fellowship together in the body of Christ and experiencing fullness of joy. Not only the expectation of the fullness of the love of Christ and the fullness of joy and the fullness of eternity, but the temporary hatred of the world, we should expect that. That's a command. Make sure that no one deceives you. That's another command. You want to live in fellowship with each other and with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and experience fullness of joy. Make sure that no one deceives you. And when John said that, he said that the people who serve Satan's interests in this world, they can be believers, right? Those people who are serving, those people are serving Satan's interests. And you can tell who those people are. And they need to stop. Instead, you need to love your brother because that is serving Jesus' interests. He says those are the children of the devil, the children of God. That's how they're known. That's not their identity, but that's who they're serving. How they treat their brother. And then he says, so don't be deceived. Don't be surprised. Don't be deceived. But love with honest works. That's what we were last week. Some of your translations will say in deeds and truth as opposed to words in the mind, our thoughts, and words of the mouth. Maybe you might understand it as thoughts and prayers, right? Love and honest works. So do things that are loving for each other. Those are coming. These are important things. We can have confidence in this life. We're, we're very properly, I think, focused on El Paso, El Paso Bible Church, focusing on having confidence in who I am in Christ. That's important. I need to know that I am in Christ, that that is simply a matter of a gift that we have received by grace through faith, that Jesus offers eternal life and identity in Him as a free gift. No strings attached. 
It is not a shackle that you bear. It is an identity that you possess, and it cannot be separated from you. It cannot be taken away from you. You can't forget it behind. You can't just leave it behind and not possess it anymore. Right? Yes? You can, see, you need to understand something. I, I don't know if I should describe When I was five years old, um, I was hit by a car um, and was essentially comatose. I don't know if it was medically, scientifically a coma. I woke up. I had no idea who my, my parents were. My first childhood memory is some very cold hospital cream of wheat. A nurse named Olga and a little teddy bear that said Joshua on it that my grandparents had left in my hospital room. I didn't know who Joshua was. I thought it was the teddy bear. Did I, was I dispossessed of my identity? I did not remember my identity, but I still possessed it, didn't I? Right? My parents came and picked me up. I did not know who they were. Childlike faith for you, right? Just go home with them. And eventually some memories came back, but I didn't even know the color purple. I rode around on a mechanic's dolly for a couple of weeks because they didn't trust me walking. I was beat up, but I was never dispossessed of my identity. So we rightly focus, right? When Christ grants you an identity, it's at that level. You may forget what your identity is. You may have it beaten out of you in a sense as far as your operating mode. You may not apply what you possess in your life in any meaningful way, but you still possess it. But John tells us more than that. He's talking to people who are that inseparably defined by their identity in Christ He says to them, you can also have confidence in what you do in this life. You should have confidence in who you are and who I am, but you can. And if your heart is experiencing condemnation, the resolution to that, right? We talked about this last week, and you can go listen if you weren't here, is not to sit there in anxiety and worry about it, but to love more. That's what he asks of us to do, is to love one another in honest works, in deeds and truth. It's not a, when we're, uh, it's important to me, let's just say, as somebody who tends towards being an overthinker. I would ask you to raise your hands, but you overthinkers won't won't overthink that. So I won't do it. How about that? I know you guys pretty well. It's important to me to know that I can know those two things. We can have confidence in what we do if we love and works in truth within the body of Christ. When we're abiding in Christ, Right, we're resting in who we are like that. We're resting in our identity that we cannot be dispossessed of, but we are also confident in who and what we're doing. We're loving our brothers in truthful works, honest works and deeds and truth. John says something that is really shocking to most of us. He says that whatever you ask, you will receive. Now, the, conten- the, the condition is that you are abiding in Christ Now, it may not be impossible for you to ask for a brand new jet while abiding in Christ. That may not be impossible. It might be improbable, right? If you're trying to love your brother in honest deeds, in works, and in truth. He says, whatever you ask, you receive. That doesn't change God, right? Y'all are good enough theologians to agree with that, right? That doesn't change God. That doesn't change God's will. That doesn't change God's objective. It does not change his manner of working. 
It doesn't bind him or manipulate him or tempt him. God is not tempted by anyone, nor does God tempt anyone. It doesn't change Jesus, but abiding in Christ does change necessarily what we ask for. Absolutely changes what we ask for. When we're abiding in Him, resting in who we are and doing what He says to do. And I think that's the key to understanding and applying that verse. It is not an incantation to be pronounced over something that I really want for Christmas. Right? It's not an incantation. It's not a spell. It's not a, a song or a thought. It's not a claim to be claimed. It's simply a trajectory that as we are abiding in Christ, we should expect the things that we ask for and the things that we receive to be in more and more perfect congruence with what Christ wants in our life. what he's commanded us to do with the things that we have. So that brings us to these last two verses of chapter 3. This is his commandment. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. Now that's a singular command. That's how John says it. This is a unified command here, one, that you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Believers. Remember, this is written to believers. There's not an unbeliever in the audience that John is writing. Everyone is under obligation to love their brothers. They all have the same brothers. But it is, a, it is a singular command with two components. It's not a gospel presentation, not for unbelievers. It's for people that need to foster fellowship in order to experience the fullness of their joy in the body of Christ. I mean, this isn't the way that the apostles or anybody else that talks to an unbeliever in Scripture um, Acts 16, right? What must I do to be saved? Work hard and believe in yourself? That's what the world says, right? What must I do to be saved? Y'all know the answer? What does the scripture say there? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what biblical record presents the gospel as to an unbeliever, somebody who has one singular ability to obey. Remember, a, a believer or excuse me, an unbeliever can hate an unbeliever, but a believer cannot hate his brother. An unbeliever can love his brother, or excuse me, love a believer, but an unbeliever cannot love his brother, not the way John uses that word. There are most of the commands in the New Testament that an unbeliever cannot obey because they have to do with how you treat your brother. They don't have those yet. The one command that they are given is to believe in Jesus Christ. For the believer, though, this is not stated as believing in the person of Jesus Christ, you have already done that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't want to presume all the time that everybody in, at a, in a service of El Paso Bible Church is a believer. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that is the only obligation, that's the only command that God has given you. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. You should not try to work or live your life in a way that is pleasing to God. He has one command for you to simply believe that Jesus Christ offers eternal life to those who believe in him. Believe in Jesus, that's what that means, and you receive it. Irrevocable identity. So if you haven't done that, I hope that you do. There's no other way to get it. There is no substitute, there is no plan B. But to these believers, John says, this is the singular command, this is what God wants for you in your life, is to believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that's a little bit different than believing in Jesus. It's, it's believing something about Jesus. There's a shade of meaning. 
It's a matter of authority and power, right? So I grew up uh, semi-feral as a child. I didn't realize it until I looked backwards. Uh, most clothing was anathema. I generally walked around and looked like I had been shipwrecked as a young child. Shorts, long hair, dirt. And so I would run around. I mean, all we lived outside the city limits. I mean, my brothers would run around. And, and occasionally, occasionally, one of our, my brother, I'm the oldest of five, and one of the younger siblings, eventually my, my little sister was often the one that did this charity, but Adam, also my youngest brother, would do this. They would come running down the street, and we'd see him. If you went down the street, down this hill, and across the road, <clears throat> through this kind of drainage ditch, and then you were in the, in the woods, man. That, that's as far as it took. They always could find us. And occasionally they would make a mistake. They would want us to come play with them, but they didn't want to play down there. And they would say, y'all need to come home. No, we're busy. We're doing semi-feral kid stuff down here in the woods. What do you want us to do? You want us to come play dolls? To my sister, whatever. You want us to come do what you want to do, but we don't want to do it. No, we're not doing that. We're going to continue our semi-feral lifestyle as long as we're allowed. But occasionally, one of them would come down and would say, Boys, dad says to come home. Now, even being the semi-feral, moderate-level heathen that I was as a young child, I went home. I went home when dad's name was invoked. Now, I'll tell you a little secret. Sometimes they were little liars. Dad didn't say come home. They just really wanted us to come home, and they figured we got home, we'd get, start playing dolls, so we wouldn't remember to be semi-feral anymore. But that makes the point, right? The name bears the authority. The name bears the power. I don't think that there is a mother of small children in here that has not said to their child, wait until your daddy comes home. With varying levels of effectiveness, I'm sure. Because there's power there. There's authority there. It's supposed to be. You believe in the name. See, we're told to believe in different things in this world. Big one in the last three years, right? Trust the science. Trust, believe. Believe the science. Trust the science. Here's the thing about science. It doesn't ask you to believe it. It doesn't ask you to trust it. Now, I ain't no scientist, man. I'm a theologian, a pastor. Theology used to be considered the queen of the sciences. It was, uh, in other words, everything served theology, but no longer. So people now treat me as if I'm not able to assess those standards. That's okay. I work well when people think that I'm dumber than I am. It's an advantage. Science doesn't ask you to believe in it. It asks you to prove it. Jesus asks you to believe in him. Jesus asks you, commands you, demands of you as believers to trust in his name. One of the reasons that that command exists is simply because it is inexplicable. It is supernatural, not provable in a sense. It's not empirical. It simply is. You believe in the power of his name. It's used a lot, mostly in the book of Acts. I'm going to read some of these verses for you. Acts 3, 6, it's a miracle. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, 
You ever sing this song as a little kid? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. My nose is stuffed up, sorry. Comes out of this verse. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Now, did Peter believe in the name of Jesus Christ? He sure did. He pronounced it over a man that could not walk with no doubts. He believed and was able to witness and experience and demonstrate the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 4.10, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. See, this is never about going to heaven when you die. This is all about activity, powerful works, in deeds and truth. Acts 4.18 is the government getting upset. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Why? Because the power that it displayed wreaked havoc on their political power. It caused people to divert their allegiance and their loyalty when they saw the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 5.40, they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus Christ and let them go. Another time, another instance. Don't speak in that name because the power and the authority of Jesus Christ is an affront the power and authority of the world. Acts 9.27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. This is Paul the apostle. He declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. It's a verifiable, witnessable activity, something that Barnabas could testify to that transformed the life of Paul, the name of Jesus. Acts 16, 18, the servant girl, you remember the servant girl that ran around behind Paul and the demon was yelling at him, unclean spirit yelling at him. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed. See, people who love the Lord can get greatly annoyed. I love Paul. Nobody has the mince words about how he is or what he's doing. He's kind of grumpy. He can get greatly annoyed. Amen. Men. Amen. A great example of apostolic authority here, being grumpy. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out at that very moment. The name of Jesus Christ. Acts 26. Well, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church of God who is at Corinth, very beginning of Corinth, the Corinth letter to the Corinthians, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. The name of Jesus Christ provides help. That's what the idea of calling on the name of Jesus Christ. Do you need help? Believers, do you need help? Yeah. Me too. When you need help, you need to believe in the name of Jesus Christ and the power and the authority that it brings. Last one we'll look at is Philippians 2.10. Now, this is just the name of Jesus. There's the name of Christ, the name of the Son of Man, the name of various different titles that Jesus Christ bears. But just to make the point, Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow 
of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. It is a powerful name. It is a powerful name on its own, an authoritative name on its own. It drives out unclean spirits. It helps those who need help. It brings all powers into submission. I don't know how many times in my life I've been told I should just bow the knee. They don't say that. They don't say that that way. They'll say something. They, ultimately, they want you to bow the knee to pragmatism. Josh, you're not going to get anywhere unless you bow the knee to that. Unless you just understand that's the way things work. I don't care how things work. I don't care what people think is the pragmatic necessity in a lot of arenas. It's not because I'm a romantic. I know y'all are surprised by that. Y'all surprised by me not being a romantic? Most people are. I'm not a romantic, not even on the inside, really. Some people are romantics on the inside. I have a brother like that. It is simply because I refuse to acknowledge that there is anyone worthy of bowing the knee to but Jesus Christ. And there's only one name that bears enough authority to bend my knee and to bow my head. I don't believe in the name of Jesus Christ perfectly or completely, but I do believe in it. And I hope that you do. That's part of the command. That's the first part. The name of Jesus Christ is something that gives you relief, right? None of this had to, they didn't have to add. There was no recipe, right? At, at the end of cer wedding ceremonies, right? I now pronounce you by the power vested in me by the state of whatever, we got multiple states represented here, the state of Texas, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I now pronounce you man and wife. There's no cooperation, is there, in these? I command you by the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. You don't bear the responsibility for that. Jesus does, and his name does. It is a benefit granted to you and to me simply by believing in the name of Jesus Christ. Now listen, there's a lot of people that don't understand the cocktail of what's happening here, right? The, the abiding believer, in that, can I say cocktail? We're far enough from being Baptist that we know that that's a word that doesn't just mean alcoholic drink, right? Cocktail is something with three ingredients. We don't have a cocktail of our own effort and our own resume and Jesus Christ involved in this thing, right? We don't bear the responsibility for that. But we do need to believe in it. We do need to wield it. We do need to. But remember, it's a singular command with two facets. They're connected. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Also, love one another, just as he commanded us. One of the primary ways that we need to believe in the, the name of Jesus Christ is the enabling that it gives us to love one another sacrificially, the way Christ did, right? That was earlier in chapter 3, that the same way that Christ loved the church, we also ought to love one another. What? The foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You mean I'm supposed to live on nothing? 
Virtually? Maybe. To give sacrificially, to love one another. Now, are you going to do that in your own name? In your own power? Under your own authority? Are you going to love sacrificially? Are you able, apart from the name of Jesus Christ, to look at another human being and say, that person is worthy of sacrificing myself for? Y'all are stock still. I think the answer is no. I mean, again, we're not talking about jumping in front of a bullet for somebody. Men are hardwired for that. I, in general, right? I know there's some cowards out there. There's some narcissists out there that consider their own lives the most important in the whole world. We're not talking about that only, but living your life daily, moment by moment, laying it down for another person. If you try to do that under your own name and under your own authority and your own power, you will fail. I will fail. But in the name of Christ, allowing Christ's name to identify the relationships, identify the fellowship, identify the needs, identify the definition of love for us, then we are able to do that. And it's by the name of Christ that doing so also produces fellowship with each other that produces a fullness of joy in doing it. Because that's the kicker, right? <clears throat> Understanding how living your life that way, loving one another the way that Christ loved the church, loved us, loved those who are the children of God by the great love that the Father has granted unto us, granted us this trajectory of all the children of God that we, one day we will be like him because we will see him as he truly is. That's the kicker, right? Being able to believe that that's what's going on, that that's what's happening. Apart from the name of Christ, that's not possible. Believing that. One who keeps his commandments abides in him. And he in him. That's a lot of pronouns. The one, the, the child of God who abides in Christ is one who keeps his commandments. And Christ abides in that child of God. It's a statement of power, of authority, those who believe in his name. I, uh, I was probably 26 or so, 27, before I heard somebody say this about the house that they bought. I finally made it into thus and such zip code. I had no idea that there were desirable zip codes in which to live. I thought that was something you put on a postcard. That was their goal in life was to live in this zip code. Some people say, I just want my kids to be in this school district. That's their apex achievement. My kids didn't even know there was such a thing as a school district because they were those sheltered homeschoolers. All people, people have weird ways of defining where they want to live. In El Paso, you have the people that think that the mountain is the place. To live. I, on the other hand, think that that's a good way to wear out the transmission in your vehicle and like to live down in the valley. Where do you want to abide, right, on the earth? You have choices there. But the way John describes this is that when we do what he says to do, we abide in him, in his name, in his power. Then where you live and what zip code you're in and what school, et cetera, starts to take a back seat if we're abiding in Christ. If we're remaining in him, dwelling in him. We have some, some military family. Some of you guys are kind of stuck here in El Paso, right? It's an aberration. 
Five years, Johnsons? Five years. That's like a lifetime in army years, right? I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a long time. I don't know how long, Timothy, y'all been here. Priscilla and I, in the early part of my ministry, would have had to have joined the military to move any more than we did. Only fairly recently have we been able to enjoy the benefits and the blessings of abiding in one spot. It's one of the things that I've never heard somebody complain about when they retire from the Army or the military in general or from various and other civilian service organizations, whatever, right, where they move a lot. There may be things that they complain about, but they never complain about not having to move every 18 months to three years because the blessings are undeniable of being in one place. And that's the description, right? You build relationships. You develop wisdom. You understand cultures. You, the list goes on. By remaining where you are. You build endurance. You understand cycles. If you're a gardener in El Paso, how many years does it take for you to realize that you need to start growing stuff in the winter? Because no flesh or plant can survive the summer. Got to grow things in the winter. That takes some time to figure out, right, Newlands? You look like you figured that one out. Take some time. The same thing, I think, is true of believing in the name of Jesus Christ and obeying his commands to love one another and abiding. That it is something you cannot communicate the benefits of Verbally, you have to experience them. Remaining faithful and consistent to love one another in the name of Jesus Christ under his power and his authority provides tremendous blessings, joyful blessings to remain there. And he makes a segue here. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us, the Spirit plays an operative component in that. He is the, the power in your life. But again, he's transitioning into chapter four where he talks about what we're supposed to do with all the spirits in the world there. But abiding in him, abiding in him, blesses us greatly, brings us great joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We do thank you for your word. We thank you that so much of it is given to instruct us in our lives here and now. Uh, that you did not simply say, hang a big carrot in front of us and say, just trust me and it, it'll all be worth it, but that you gave us instructions on how to live and how to love each other and how to exist in fellowship for joy in this life and how to please you, and we thank you for that. We love you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I did actually almost forget communion. It does happen. I stayed up a little past my bedtime last night. Friends, this is just simply a remembrance. I know that... Uh, there are a whole lot of opinions in the world. But it is a, it is a remembrance and a proclamation <clears throat> that as often as we do these things, as we remember what Christ has done for us, Paul says that we proclaim his death until he comes. One of the ways, I think, if we're to relate it to 1 John, that we believe in his name, in his power, and in his authority that is to come to this earth so that we'll be with him forever from that moment forward. So as we remember, we also proclaim those things. Paul tells us that we ought to do it in a worthy manner. And so he encourages people in 1 Corinthians especially to make sure that he, they have confessed the sin that they know about in their lives, that they're not proclaiming to have communion 
fellowship with each other deceptively. And so I want to take that seriously. I take that seriously, and I hope that you do too in these few moments, uh, that you would make those things right, at least in your heart. But if uh, someone is here that you have something against, you ought to make that right in person. All right? Give us a few moments to pray, and then I'll call the men forward. Men, if you would come forward.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you stand with us? And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body on earth as we share. 